Hi, I'm Nicola Jennings, one of the co-founders of Athena Art Foundation. This is Athena Asks, a podcast where we talk to artists, curators, historians, and collectors about their work, pre-modern art, and the world today. Hi, I'm John Quillet Riley. I'm one of the presenters of Athena Asks, and my guest today is the inimitable curator of Italian and Spanish paintings at the National Gallery of Ireland, Aoife Brady. Aoife, welcome. It's such a joy to have you. Oh, thank you. Delighted to be here. So Aoife, I know that you are working currently on a Lavinia Fontana exhibition. I thought it would be nice to just chat a little bit about the painting that is the focal point of the exhibition and it was sort of your starting point really. Can you tell me about how it entered the museum's collection and what it's been doing before you started focusing on it? Of course. This painting, The Visit of the Queen of Sheba to King Solomon, is considered Fontana's most ambitious composition ever and it's the largest surviving painting she ever made. It entered our collection very early on in the gallery's history. So the gallery opened its doors in 1864 and we purchased the, the painting in 1872, but it had a sort of extraordinary history prior to our acquisition. It had been in the Zambacari collection in Bologna up until around 1850. And then it becomes part of Prince Napoleon's collection in Paris. Not bad. And I, I know, I mean, <laughs> fairly illustrious, as you can imagine. And it's in, it's in the Palais Royal, uh, displayed among his other masterpieces. And in 1871, during the Paris Commune, the revolutionaries set the Palais Royal alight. And so the Fontana, this monumental, this giant canvas, is one of a select number of paintings that's rescued from the burning building and brought to London. Um, and that's where we purchased it in 1872 from Christie's in London. I like to think of our, you know, your predecessors and my predecessors, you know, working out this deal. No, it's, it's amazing, though, to think that even then it was obviously valued. I mean, the size of it, when you see it and you stand in front of it, the figures in it are almost life size. I can't imagine how they, they transported it out in those circumstances, but they did. And thankfully they did. And, and it arrived on our doorstep in 1872. And it's been a sort of highlight of our collection since, although it had suffered, obviously, through fire damage and then early restorations and it had darkened as oil paintings do. And so when we came to it in 2018, we, we mounted a massive conservation and research project on the painting, which was sponsored by the Bank of America. And it's absolutely transformed it over about 18 months. Our conservators worked on it and it's a, it's a different painting now. It really is. Is it surprising that the National Gallery of Ireland would have gone for a painting like this for a female artist? Because it was not an insignificant purchase. And then I'm quite interested to know in between, has it always been a focal point of the collection? Has it always been regarded with such esteem or is it sort of being revisited and reevaluated anew? Is it surprising? I don't know. When you see the painting and how ornate and elaborate it is, that must have been what attracted our director to it at the time. Um, it was purchased during a period when we were actively trying to acquire a national collection for Ireland and we had been given this small acquisitions budget to, to do so and so a lot of the sort of founding members of the gallery were traveling to Rome and to London and buying what they could. So I think you know there was an element of luck and serendipity absolutely. As for whether it was unusual to have collected a female artist at the time I think Lavinia Fontana was regarded quite well even at that point in history and obviously this painting had this illustrious provenance that definitely helped it. We did buy around the same time a Sophonise by Anguissola but we bought it as a Sanchez Coelho so <laughs> that yeah. wasn't a delivery. <laughs> it wasn't uh, you know trying to address a gender imbalance I'll put it that way but I suppose yeah it is a, a lucky accident maybe along with some good curatorial eye that led to it making its way to Dublin. Nice. I think an exhibition like this is so timely because you know, obviously a lot of museums are looking afresh at what they have in storage and some paintings that perhaps have been misattributed to male artists. But to have a painting like this already in your collection, a painting that's as impressive as this is and ticks so many boxes in what people are looking for and collecting right at the moment. And to be able to build an exhibition around this is, is quite a boon. What was your first vision for the exhibition? What did you want to encapsulate really about her work? Well, I suppose I wanted to introduce people to the, the cultural climate in which she was working. It's quite extraordinary, Bologna in the 16th century, how liberal in many ways it was and how it encouraged women to be visible in society and, and be involved in activities publicly. And so I wanted to introduce people to Lavinia Fontana and help them to understand what it was that allowed her to become the first professional female artist outside a convent or a court. 
and allowed her to be the first female artist with her own workshop. She is this forerunner. She's this absolute trailblazer really she's a trailblazer it's the best word for it i know you've used it before yeah i that that's a, that's our working title for the exhibition at the moment livinia fontana rule breaker trailblazer because it was the best way i could introduce her to people that she was a woman of so many firsts and so i think it's important to ground people in that culture to, to explain what was special about bologna as the second papal state to rome as a city without a court as a city with europe's oldest university all of these different specific circumstances led to the birth of Fontana. And then after her, we have Elisabetta Sirani and we have a great tradition of women artists in Bologna. It's a quite a special place. So I'm hoping that the exhibition can evoke that. And we're going to you know, include some objects and textiles in order to ground people in that reality and try to help them to understand what, what a place it was. When we talk about Livinia Fontana being a woman of many firsts, because she was the, the first woman that we know to have been documented as having her own workshop, I think it's difficult for the modern audience to necessarily get their heads around the fact that to even have a career is almost impossible at this moment. Women you know, did not have access to the models that men had access to for academic drawings. I know that Babette Bonn has spoken about the legal hurdles that women faced, even if they'd managed to get themselves to a point where they'd you know, been able to train, where they'd been able to build up enough of a reputation for themselves as a painter, just simply being able to get through some of the contracts that needed to be signed, having men who would have to sign on their behalf. One of the things that really strikes people as a, as a modern audience when I try to explain how many glass ceilings Fontana broke yeah. is, like you say, it was difficult enough to be trained as a woman in the Renaissance period in the 16th century. Fontana was trained by her father Prospero and she was you know a very accomplished painter at an early age but her parents recognized at a very early stage of her career that one of the necessities for her in order to freely engage in business negotiations were, was marriage so she had to get married in the 16th century you know to keep one's profession up after you're married was sort of unheard of and so they found a perfect husband for her they found this local nobleman who had trained as a painter with Prospero as well from Imola named Paolo Zappi. And they had a very unusual marriage contract that stipulated that Fontana was essentially to remain the breadwinner and that she would be allowed to continue to work and that Paolo Zappi would come and live with Prospero and Lavinia in Bologna. And so they made, they, they kind of manufactured this amazing relationship that enabled her to continue her work and enabled her to continue to progress. And I think that that's one of those things that when a modern audience hears about it, they go, wow, that is liberal. My grandmother, for example, she was a poultry inspector. There you go, strange job. But she had to quit that job when she married my, my grandfather. And that was pretty standard in Ireland up until, you know, the 90s nearly. So for a 16th century woman to have kept on working and maintained her career and found a man who would support her through that is, is extraordinary. And they had 11 children, 11 babies. And he stayed at home and looked after them. I mean, first of all, love a beta male how much he was doing with the actual childcare? sure we don't necessarily know <laughs> but I, th I think it's fascinating the fact that a it happened at all and uh, b that they managed to find somebody that fit those criteria and c that they stipulated it in the marriage contract the lengths that her family that her parents were going to to ensure her success i, I suppose they knew she was skyrocketing <laughs> and so they were doing everything to keep that that path open for her Oh, she had incredible guidance from both parents. Her mother came from a large publishing house in Bologna, so she was very well connected as well. And her father was an artist, an esteemed artist in his day. And so they kind of had Lavinia very well placed as a young woman to become this brilliant artist. They had ensured that she learned Latin. She was well educated. She knew about classical antiquity. And then after training her as a painter, the last piece of the puzzle was that ability to to go out in public and and negotiate freely and that was you know to become a woman of virtue through marriage but it is amazing that they made the stars align essentially in this very unique way it's, it's incredible i think then you see that education that she's had reflected through the sitters that she's able to secure or the sitters who are able to secure her as their portrait painter let's put it that way as well what i find interesting is the way that Art historians have talked about her in you know, sort of the last few generations, and you know, really quite recently too, about how she you know, pays such particular attention to clothing, to jewels and to textiles. It's 
quite often written in a way that can be very slightly patronising, in that, oh, she's a female, or she's a lady artist, doesn't she like the clothes? And that's why the ladies like to sit for her. That's so clearly not the mindset of the contemporary sitters and these patrons who were sitting for her. We perhaps today don't always recognise the importance of what these sitters were wearing, what they were trying to project through the clothing that they chose for their portraits. Whereas the artists would have very specifically known <laughs> if they're wearing a certain thing, they would sure want everybody to know it. Absolutely. No, I find it very reductive. We don't know if Lavinia Fontana was a particularly fashionable or vain woman, but what we do know is that she was very clever because she recognised this gap in the market. As you say, she understood the power of clothing in society and she understood that particularly for women in society that they could make real statements through their outfits. And we know that she paid very special attention to it in that she took home sitters' jewellery, for example, so that she could render it in real minute detail. So she respected the importance of these sessions and the stories that they told. And I think the other thing to say in that context is that while people might consider it a sort of very feminine pursuit, painting costume, actually, if she was adhering to tradition, Fontana would have been painting exclusively still life, flower paintings, miniatures. These grand portraits were not the remit of the woman artist at the time, whether they be in a convent or a court or elsewhere. These were things that male artists were producing prior to Fontana. And we know from Malvasia, from her primary biographer in the 17th century, that women in Bologna absolutely flocked. This is the words he used. They flocked to Lavinia. They were mad about Lavinia. They wanted to have their portrait painted by her, probably because she had that understanding that she was, she was a smart woman. Well, you see in her portraits of women, they have this sense of power too. That is unusual. There's a certain presence and a certain power that's projected through these portraits of Bolognese women that's quite unusual for the period. Obviously, their clothing is a part of that. It's not just about showing how wealthy they are. It's showing what they have access to. It's interesting then to talk about the sitters in the Queen of Sheba because it had been misunderstood for quite a long time. Can you talk us through the new dating of the painting? It's complicated. Well, the new dating was easy. That was the easiest part <laughs> of all of the research that I carried out in this painting. So we started the conservation project in 2018 and the painting returned to the wall at the end of last year in November of 2021. So it was a fairly long project. Prior to this restoration campaign, we had dated it to around 1600 purely based on style because we don't have early provenance for this work. And then during the conservation, we found a date on the bottom of a clock held by one of the ladies in waiting inscribed quite clearly is 1599. So we weren't far off the money, which was brilliant. But one of the more interesting aspects of the research end of the project was re-evaluation of the identity of the sitters. We know that the subject matter that Fontana is painting in this big canvas is the Queen of Sheba's visit to King Solomon. She tells the viewer what they're looking at in an inscription on the step at the bottom left-hand side of the painting. But it's clearly not a biblical scene. This is a huge allegorical portrait. All of the sitters are in 16th century dress. They're all very individualistic and sort of quirky in their appearance. So it was clear, I think, to anybody who looked at the painting across the centuries that these were real people, that these were not imagined biblical figures. The painting doesn't appear in documentary record at all until the end of the 1700s when it's recorded in a survey saying that it's in a collection in Bologna, in the Casa Zambacardi in Bologna. And then it's recorded again in another survey, again in Bologna in 1850. And around that time, in the early 1800s, Luigi Lanzi also sees the painting in Bologna and describes it without any explanation explanation as a portrait of the Duke and Duchess of Mantua. Just, just pluck that out there. <laughs> there you go. And so, so the reason I give you, I so give you the survey dates is that it, it was in Bologna before Lanzi's mention and it's in Bologna again after and then it goes off to Paris and the rest as they say, is history. But what's fascinating is that Lanzi says nothing about why he believes this to be the Duke and Duchess of Mantua. I mean, it's clearly a 16th century court and you have this wonderful hunting dog and a, a little person who we might associate with the Mantuan court. But of course, they were in courts all over Italy. And what's incredible then is that no one does anything with the Lanzi reference until the mid 20th century when Eleanor Tuck writes this great book, Her Hidden Heritage, about women artists. And it's one of the first in modern scholarship that focuses on female old masters. Tufts talks about Fontana as part of this sort of compendium and she revisits Lanzi's suggestion that this painting is a portrait of the Duke and Duchess of Mantua who at the time that it was painted would have been Vincenzo Gonzaga and Eleonora de Medici mm -hmm. and she says well the sitters in the Fontana portrait look very much like those in Rubens great trinity altarpiece in the Palazzo Te which has these donor portraits of Vincenzo and Eleonora and after that subsequent scholars have just sort of repeated it and expanded further and expanded further but at no point has anyone gone back and said 
was Luigi Lanzi correct? How can we be sure? And what struck me about it is that no one who's talked about the painting has ever compared the portraits, has ever illustrated the Dublin portrait alongside that by Rubens. And when I looked at the two beside one another, it was very problematic. While you have to be careful about comparing portraits of the same person by different hands, they're never going to look identical. But the sitter in our portrait, Vincenzo and Eleonora in Rubens' portrait, are distinctly different to those in Fontana. And in fact, there's plenty of portraits of the Duke and Duchess of Mantua, all of which show Eleonora with this very sharp jawline, black hair and our Sheba is the opposite her features are quite rounded she's just a different woman there's no question about it in my mind at least and she's red hair as well I mean red hair versus black it just didn't fit it's a bit of a a clincher and the other thing that struck me was the age difference between Solomon and Sheba so in our painting Solomon looked like an older man while Sheba is quite a young woman now of course depicting Solomon as an older man might just be a way to emphasize the king's wisdom but it was so distinct and if they're supposed to be portraits then there was about five years between Vincenzo and Eleonora. Certainly um, wouldn't be very flattering to no. me. <laughs> it wouldn't be very flattering. I wouldn't be pleased. I don't know about you. So we went back and tried to start again from square one. And I believe that this is the Duke and Duchess of Ferrara, who at the time were in Alfonso d'Este and Margarita Gonzaga. And there are tons of little links to Margarita in this painting, not least the pearls. There's pearls everywhere. Everywhere. Margarita is Latin for pearl. Pearls were Margarita's attribute. They were something that were associated with her. And then we have 16th century literature that compares Margarita to Sheba in her virtues, including a poem by Tasso. And then we looked at, at portraits of the pair of the Duke de Ferrara and our painting and it just sits so well. Margarita was Alfonso's third wife and there was about 30 years of an age difference between them. So that correlated perfectly. And then there's a great likeness between them. When you look at portraits, contemporary portraits of the Duke and Duchess of Ferrara versus our painting, they sit very, very well. The profiles are the same, the hair colours, eye colours, everything works. Yeah, it it was quite a fun exercise. So I think we're kind of getting a little bit closer to understanding the origins of this painting, which still remain a little bit mysterious. It is fascinating being able to drill down. And it's so common that you'll have erroneous <laughs> scholarship that just gets parroted. And perhaps in previous generations of art historians, it can be forgiven because you didn't necessarily have the capacity to compare paintings side by side and you didn't necessarily have images of everything in colour. But now there's just no excuse for it when you can pull them both up on your screen and say, hang on a sec. <laughs> What I also find interesting, you talked about these portraits being quite individuated. Surely those women in the entourage are known women. I think you've also started to piece together some identifications of them too, is that right? Well, I don't know identifications, but I can definitely say that they are women that Fontana painted on other occasions, which would suggest that absolutely these are portraits of real women. It's a very complicated portrait or painting. Those faces that you see, those ladies in waiting, technical analysis has revealed to us that their faces had been painted to a good level of completion, nearly finished, and then painted out and repainted about 10 centimetres higher, which is bizarre. So it looks as though the faces are almost the same, but it's difficult to say with certainty that she didn't replace them with new people, but it, it may have been to insert these wonderful roughs. But they do appear in other portraits by Fontana. There's one of the ladies in waiting I've identified with a portrait in Petworth House, Sussex. And another one looks very much like a painting in the Walters Museum in Baltimore. So Mm. some of these sitters are identified and others aren't. But I'm almost certain that they are Bolognese noblewomen. They're women that Fontana would have known personally, perhaps. She was also very clever in the way that she marketed herself to the Bolognese women. Uh, Archbishop Pagliotti, who was the Archbishop of Bologna at the time, encouraged women to get out and engage in charitable activities. And they kind of had these sort of girls clubs, essentially, where they would literally, they're described as traveling in groups around the city and they all lived on the same street. These aristocratic women, these members of the Quaranta of the 40 families, the 40 aristocratic families of the city. And Fontana established her studio on the same street and she made these women godparents for knew children. She knew what she was doing. <laughs> and she, she had 11 of them. Woman. So. <laughs> she did. I will, four, only four outlived her. It's shocking to even think mm. about. But she was very, very clever in that way. And so she seems to have developed a very strong relationship with some of these women. And they were very involved in one another's lives. She would be there to record births and deaths and marriages and everything in between. But they seem to reappear again in Sheba and Solomon. And why that is, is a bit of a mystery. What we do know about the painting is that it's something that she worked on for a long period of time. So this is something that I believe was in her studio for almost a decade. And technical analysis demonstrates that in the way that the paint layers have dried, she's applied one layer of paint and let it dry completely, which takes a long time for oil, Mm. and then repainted entire passages of this work. She's repositioned the big balustrade on the balcony that you see in the background. She made the heads much higher. So that's quite a number 
number of heads it's yeah. a big passage she's changed the color of most of the outfits so this seems to have been a painting that sat in her studio and I believe that that is because Alfonso d'Este dies in 1597 so the Duke of Ferrara married Margarita Gonzaga as his third wife in the hopes of producing an heir and you can see all these wonderful symbols of fertility throughout the painting which we'll talk about in a second the point is this painting was either created in celebration of a visit of the Duke and Duchess of Ferrara or possibly for the Duke and Duchess of Ferrara and while she was working on it, Alfonso pops his clogs and it becomes a monumental painting of a court that no longer exists because when Alfonso dies, the court of Ferrara collapses. And so I think this remained in her studio, maybe became a showpiece, which would explain why she's included some of their faces. And then she leaves for Rome in 1604 and it was assimilated quietly into a local collection because the Zambacari family, they were part mm. of these circles that Fontana worked with. So that's our kind of theory. It's complicated and exciting, but technical analysis has given us so much. Such a game game changer isn't it well, I'm really interested because I'm a fashion dweeb about the, the changes in color of the gowns and about the repositioning of the heads and you know is that possibly to make way for the refs it sounds like perhaps it's more likely that it's a change of who those people might have been portraying just as you have each of those individuated personalities depicted the fashion is different and individual the queen is wearing a much more sort of square necked gown and then you also have the French style gown that's buttoned all the way up with a standing collar. Some of them are wearing a bodice underneath with that sired over mantle, unbuttoned. Many of them have got round open sleeves, guitar shaped sleeves almost with a slash. Now, earlier in the century, they tended to slash right from the shoulder, but here they've got a slit at the elbow and then they're joined. It's just an excuse to have more jewels to sort of use them as a ganchi, as hooks to clip your those slits together. And then those textiles, each one is so incredibly expensive. You've got these changing silks, many of them have those white dashes across them horizontally, which is clearly Lavinia's way of showing you the weft of the silver threads in the fabric, capturing that sheen that it has as it catches the light. And at every opportunity, more textile is exposed. So you've got that overmantle, and then almost all of them have it open at the front, to show another gown. Most of them have a farthingale, so you can see they're stiffened and they've got that sort of conical shape to the movement that she's capturing. Despite the fact that you've got these really, really heavy textiles and she's showing you that, she's making it very, very clear you know, how patterned they are, how thick they are in the brocades and in the patterned weaves. It would have been really difficult to move elegantly with all of this weight. Most of these clothes would be gathered. You can't chop about this fabric because it's you know, so costly. So they tended to be gathered and pulled in and stitched together in ways that could be then reopened. And yet she captures these flowing, graceful movements in the women as they're turning and she manages to make it feel really immediate. What's really fascinating and what you're going to be able to show through bringing in textiles to give people an idea of the craftsmanship of these fabrics and how important it was for these women to show what they're wearing. It's really good for the modern eye. She's also showing the craftsmanship that's coming out of the city and that's really important for these figures. You know, they want to be able to show their patronage, not just to the local artists, but look at these lace makers I've got access to. Look at these weaving centers, these dyes that we can get, the different shades that you're seeing over and over, the very careful way in which she's showing the way that they catch the light or absorb the light. She's just so technical in, in her depiction of these fabrics. It's fantastic. Well, of course, at the time, Bologna was the Italian centre for silk mm -hmm. production. So this was as much a source of civic pride as anything. I think that there's a kind of a real statement here that Fontana is displaying the city's wares. What's really amazing when you see the painting up close as well is that she's not implying pattern, you know, using summary brushstrokes to kind of give the impression of brocaded silk. She's painted every pattern, every pearl, every thread with incredible attention to detail. And then the lace is a whole different story. And her technique in painting lace is just unparalleled. It's glorious. She uses lead white pigment, almost like thread. She'll have a loaded brush and let the lead white sort of drape onto the painting and create this lace pattern that has a wonderful impasto, this great three-dimensional texture that gives you a tactile impression. It's astonishing, isn't it, that you can use a medium that's so sort of thick and heavy to create the impression of something so light to the point of being transparent. And also you know, each one of those ruffs has a different lace pattern and they're all wearing different collar styles as well. What fascinates me is that it's not just an individual personality that she portrayed through the lace, but theoretically a specific family. Mm. Because noble families in this period had often their own lace pattern that was a sort of like a Scottish tartan that was exclusive to them. My and family there are, has one, in fact. A lace yours. pattern or a tartan. Yeah. 
<laughs> both yeah I don't have a lace pattern personally nor do I know an awful lot about them but I have been trying without success to identify these because there are surviving design books that have these patterns mapped out maybe somebody listening will know all about 16th century aristocratic bolognese lace uh, that would be that would be fabulous you see a similar thing in figured silks in some of those scrolling forms you have leaves and specific flowers that are connected to different houses and that can also be a way of identifying people I think we might have to have a collective effort for uh, for, for identifying all the all the velvets, all the silks. All out for help. <laughs> this painting has made it very easy for me to put together a loans exhibition, a major monograph on Fontana, because it says so much about her oeuvre, and and from it you can pull different themes. You see portraits. You have people with unique physical disabilities. You have, as you say, the textiles, the lace, landscape in the background. You have these still life elements. You have animals. It's her painting portraiture, but also allegory. There's a religious theme. It's almost a manifesto of her ability. The idea that it potentially was sitting in her studio for a decade and what it witnessed <laughs> over that decade. Can you tell me a bit about the objects that you're bringing in for the exhibition and what, what were the things that were more challenging to find? Well, a lot of them will relate to this painting specifically. So certainly textiles. And you and I have spoken at length about this, where I might be able to find contemporary examples. And I'm hoping that we'll have some wonderful comparable textiles to display. But I've also requested a table clock, very similar to the one that this lady in waiting holds that has our date on it. Fantastic. Um, and as you know, I'm looking for a Zibellino for one of these little Martin heads. And if you look closely on the right hand side of the painting, you'll see a person of colour who's presenting a tray of these beautiful gold and silver goods. And these goods would have all been associated with a 16th century bridal trousseau or corrido, as they were known. And the Zibellino in that context is really key. The Zibellino was an accessory that women wore. They hung these from their belts as fertility talisman. They also, when they had a fur pelt attached, had the dual function of attracting fleas, as far as I understand. <laughs> Supposedly, that's something I've never quite bought. The specific Martin's fur that you would use was so prized because of its silkiness. It was soft whichever way you stroked it. I perhaps could do with one myself. <laughs> A little comfort Martin. <laughs> but the, the Zivellini were, of course, incredibly expensive. But fur itself was the most prized. But also then, of course, those jeweled heads. Because these little Martins would be wearing their own earrings. They quite often had sort of mechanical jeweled tongues and teeth. What's really frustrating is there are only a few that survive today. But the fact is they go out of fashion. The value of the gold and the jewels was far more than the quirky object as it was. So they'd be melted down and the jewels reused. You see the same, in fact, with textiles. The material value of these textiles, they would be used again and again and again and then when they couldn't be used anymore they'd be drizzled burnt down for their metallic properties all of those pearls and jewels that you see would be unpicked and reused so it's a real challenge to find surviving items oh no i mean i'm not a fashion specialist or a decorative arts specialist or a textile specialist i'm a painting person exclusively so i went into this blissfully ignorant i was saying oh well wouldn't it be nice to borrow some 16th century textiles and jewelry and have since come to the realization that they're really is a limited amount available but I'm hoping that even just a few objects that are dotted through the display will give people that grounding as you say that insight into the intricacies of the production of these kinds of objects of these textiles and also their centrality to 16th century Italian culture. I think because she's not a Baroque painter, and in fact, our painting kind of encapsulates that transition from the Mannerist, from the weird elongated forms of the Mannerist period. And you can see that a lot of the ladies in waiting have very long fingers and their bodies are quite stretched and they have these slightly odd Mannerist proportions. She's more difficult for a contemporary audience to engage with. It's easy to sort of relate to Artemisia because she paints with this wonderful immediacy, this hyper realism almost that she, you know, of course, takes from her father and from Caravaggio. But Lavinia is a little bit more difficult in that her work is slightly more abstracted. It's not stylistically as accessible, perhaps. So I think at least by including some of these objects, it'll, it'll remind people or help people to realise that they're looking at real human beings that, that existed at a point in time and, you know, that had sort of very independent lives and relatable lives in some instances. And that's what I hope to do in the exhibition as well, is try and pull out a lot of these very human stories. And there are so many and they're very richly documented in a lot of cases, which is wonderful. So. I'm looking forward to it very much. Uh, I cannot wait. <laughs> so, 
Um, well, I'm looking forward to talking to you more about it, hopefully in the coming months, and we'll check in again perhaps to hear more about the loans that you've secured and the form of the exhibition as a whole as we get closer to the time. In the meantime, Aoife, thank you so much for joining us on the Athena Asks podcast. It's been an absolute dream to have you as a guest. <laughs> oh, it's my absolute pleasure. And just to flag, the exhibition opens on the 6th of May, 2023. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.